Emilio, you are the part of the conference. You are the member of the PC. You are the one of the track leaders. So you are. You, you should understand that we has to shorten you. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. And that's why I brought this slide up, and that's not what I'm presenting. Here. Okay. okay. Thank you, Emilio. Because we were speaking about turbulence, okay. and turbulence modeling, and that's my my great passion. You one 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 talking for one hour. And it's it's pretty good, right? Emilio is a professor at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he will give us. Uh, Insight in advancing CFD methods to ensure low cost, zero carbon energy. So, since we were speaking about turbulence first, I brought up how you know, these data, for example, that, that we are able to obtain from, from the DNS have driven a lot of the improved understanding and how we put it into turbulence model, and that's a very complex part. So, Zora had promised that if I talked about that, he would kill me, so that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, instead, I tried to make it a bit more entertaining, okay? And we'll be talking about how to ensure low cost, zero carbon energy. Now, That's you, why you have this shirt. You probably will notice from bullet number one in my shirt. So what I call low cost, zero carbon energy is a nuclear power plant, okay? So I'm slightly biased in my point of view. I have to admit, okay? So I better put that as point number one. That I'm slightly biased on what is low cost, zero carbon energy. But low cost is the issue. Well, low is low. The problem compared to gas in the United States, when everything else is at zero, low is not low enough. But we had a presentation from West all this morning compared to Germany. Our power is free. <laughs> so the second part that I will try to do instead is show you why modeling and simulation is important in developing low cost zero carbon energy. I'll give you only one slide of what we do in the United States to develop this methodology and uh, to be able to support uh, the nuclear power fleet, but in reality to support every energy producing uh, activity because the methodology can be used everywhere. I'll give two very brief examples on the multi-phase flow and I made sure to put no formulas in there, okay? So you had enough, two presentations, I think the details, I'll skip a lot of that. But I will show at least one fun possibility on, on what we're looking at trying to do for advanced energy systems. Uh, I flew here on the flight from Boston to Munich on an A350, okay? Fantastic airplane by Airbus, in which for the first time I didn't need to put headphones to sleep because I cannot hear the engine, okay? It's a plane that takes off and you're wondering if the engine on, okay? <laughs> now, the other part that is incredible about this engine is that before it started flying, it had been licensed to fly 370 minute ETOPS, right? Now, if you're a flight engineer, you know what ETOPS mean. I like the acronym, which is engines turning of passengers swimming. Okay, so it means how far can you go without an engine? Okay, that's what he talks me. Well, that plane, without ever flying, was licensed by the regulators to fly 370 minutes. How is that possible? Because everything is done through computation. The aerospace has done a great job of leveraging computation and only have very few tests at the end to confirm the computations rather than spend 20 years and, uh, as Chris will know very well, del delivering three tracks of paper data to the regulator, okay? <laughs> now, so I wanted to give an example while I was flying. I was thinking, you know, how is gonna, how would that plane have looked if a nuclear engineer had designed it, okay? <laughs> Instead of looking like that. And what I came up with is more like this, okay? <laughs> so my plane probably would have looked something like this, okay? <laughs> So I, I hope this starts making the point, but to give a little bit more hard time to our nuclear designers is why are the methods so important? Well, because we've designed our reactors with one-dimensional methodologies, right? So my lower plenum is one volume, and my, everything is one-dimensional volume. So it's clear that the way we can optimize our reactor, it's a beautiful bucket, right? We can do whatever we want. For the model, it's a bucket. So even if you improve it, when you go and license it, it's still going to be a bucket. So you need three-dimensional methods in order to design something that is what we hope to see in the future. Here, I want to thank Dr. Ian McDonald. He's a plant uh, architect for the UK. Uh, he has worked on delivering the architecture, so the site implementations of all the nuclear power plants recently in the UK. And here we came up with a modular reactor that we could locate inside the campus at MIT. Of course, when I proposed that at MIT, not everybody was too happy about it. <coughs> but that's what I want to see as the future, okay? We should be able to make everything compact enough to fit in there. Now, in order to do that, 
the United States government, and I would say somehow before we had the current president probably, and, uh, had understood that modeling and simulation was fundamental to the fleet. Okay? And so had pushed programs that are capable of developing the computational tools to support the fleet. And we have two major programs ongoing in the United States. One is the Consortium for Advanced Simulation of Light Water Reactor, where I lead the thermal hydraulic part. Challenging project because they gave us a short timeline. They said in 10 years we want tool that industry can use. Okay? So all the complexity that you've seen before on the multi-phase, you say, okay, now bring it together because I need to use it. Okay? And we have an industry council that wants to see how we deliver those tools. They don't want to see how we develop them. At the same time, there is a longer program which is called NIMS that develops the tools themselves. And the plan right now, uh, coming from very high in the government, is that they want to see these two things come together. Okay? And so in the future, you'll probably see these two programs working more closely together. To put that on the tweet. <laughs> <laughs> now, if I look at what we do in my group uh, at MIT, uh, we try to do, of course, all the simulation methods that cover from single phase all the way to high void fractional regimes. Right? So we really work on all the areas. I'm lucky enough to have a very large team. I have 17 PhD students working for me and answering the question, you know, discussing what, what Greta was bringing about. It takes me three years just to bring them up to speed because the other 14 or 15 students are training them, okay? After three years, they can start doing some work. So a PhD takes eight years at the end, okay? It's a long time to get a PhD in multi-facebook. It's, it's not a, a short time frame. So in this talk, I want to give you an idea of a little less of the very fundamental, but the challenges that they come up when you try to apply to the whole reactor. And here I try to put a few examples of where I, I've had experience in applying CFD, and it's really all across a nuclear power plant, right? Going from mixing in the vessels to failures of, of T junctions, steam generators, and you know, all heat exchanger. In this case, is the Fukushima plant suppression pool. Okay, so we really have to apply our computational modeling everywhere. So the two examples I'm going to bring about today are related to the work on the, the bubbly flow regime mostly, so relatively low void fraction, where the approach we are trying to bring is bring locally inside the CFD what we call mesoscale model. So what is the point? We, we come from, we're nuclear engineers, but in general as engineers we come from seeing everything a little bit lumped, right? So our correlations are very integral. When we go in CFD we now have a tool that is extremely local, to be very general, it has to be completely local, right? It has to know that, which one is my laser pointer, that in this point, the bubble shape is different from the bubble shape here, right? Like he was mentioning how important is the bubble shape, but I need to know it locally. I cannot have a bubble shape that is the same everywhere. Right? So I have to have those informations in, in all locations. And so we had to work on a lot of different components. Starting, for example, from one of the things that I will not discuss, but is how are bubbles behaving at the wall, right? For many years, we've been using lubrication forces in multi-phase to then find out that they don't exist, right? Bubbles, as you saw in the DNS of a uh, so bubbles are sitting at the wall. There is no real lubrication. So you have to, we developed an analytical model that describes the forces near the wall rather than imposing a fake lubrication force. We have to treat the turbulence, and we just finished the whole PhD on that. I will not discuss the detail. Instead, since we don't, I knew that I mean, a key of first, we will be talking about lift. I want to see some of the challenges we found out when trying to implement lift in, a, in, a, in real commercial reactor applications. Of course, my advantage is we have access to a large amount of data. One of the big challenges for my students and also for all the other students that try to work in the CASEL program is that we need to kind of always go beyond what is the current status of the experiment, right? We have all this data. We would love to have a whole new generation of data, but that will take five years to get, and the students will have to graduate by that. So our real job has been how do we extract as much as possible out of this and then give ideas for the future to, to, to the experimentalist, okay? And so I have to thank, of course, collaborators everywhere and uh, uh, Greta's data were very important and uh, Igor at North Carolina State also complements by pushing higher Reynolds number. Now on the lift model itself, it's a good example of how you create troubles to students. That topic was first assigned to Oak Ridge National Laboratory and the, the two PhD students in a row quit the PhD after trying to deliver a lift model for turbulent flow. 
And then the supervisor decided to quit as well. <laughs> so I felt pretty guilty about that. <laughs> so we decided that maybe we take over that and we worked at MIT on that, so at least only my students would be stressed. <laughs> so I discussed only that region, but of course one of the things that uh, Professor Podowski was bringing about is, well, when I'm in a turbulent flow, uh, I can't really separate the lift where we are from everything else, right? There is no way I can quantify only the lift. At the minimum, I have two forces which are turbulent dispersion and lift. So all the forces how they are acting together, they're very strongly intercorrelated. So unfortunately, if you want to decouple them, you have to do some tricks. One of the typical tricks is we assume a specific form of the turbulent dispersion. If we correlate the turbulent dispersion in a certain way to the turbulent conditions, so that we have fixed that, then we can focus on the lift. Of course, you'll have to iterate a few times, right? Until you find out. Now that's where the DNS could come handy, and these learning machine methods could finally allow you to maybe separate a little bit. Currently, this is the approach in which we fix the turbulent dispersion at the classic form that Burns pro proposed based on just the uh, oscillations, so the, uh, the transient component of the drag forces. Based on that, we correlate everything else. Now, we have seen that in all the experiments, and Akio made a fantastic Exp uh, explanation of how you put together all the different conditions, different fluids, how you can really demonstrate that lift and lift inversion in particular is related to bubble shape. Right? And we grew up, you know, we, we tend to trust his data. Right? I always joke with my students that Akio probably knows his bubbles by name, right? <laughs> because he spent so much time uh, at each bubble that gave it a name, right? But surname so, is always Tommy Exactly. And so we tend to trust his fine, right? Really? And so we put on one side that, okay, we know that that is true. And if we even we didn't trust it, right, the work of Legendre Magnete, even further as confirmed, they were able to really almost semi-analytically confirm that that work is correct. Still, when I push Greta to push higher Reynolds numbers, and I go and look at those bubbles, well, I start seeing discrepancies, right? Things are not working exactly in that direction. In particular, first I can look and, you know, if we track one of the single bubbles, and I try to analytically derive the lift coefficient in the same way that I was doing for my single bubble rising, <laughs> already I'm one order of magnitude lower, right? So there is already something different. But most importantly, we start seeing bubbles that are not where they should be. Now, it's hard to show it from the DNS, but it's easier to show it if we take a set of typical experimental data. A B K N C so data that we use for years in our sub-channel codes and our lump uh, one-dimensional codes. And here we start seeing something interesting. Based on bubble shapes, these are all pretty spherical bubbles. They're not very distorted. Okay? So based on our assumption, they should all be sitting at the wall. Instead, many of them have moved toward the center of the channel. But there is one more interesting thing. They have done it exactly opposite to what we expected. So low it was number, which would be the one at the wall, that moved toward the center of the channel. And high it was number, which would be the one that moved in the center, that are sticking to the wall. So we have the exact opposite trend of what we were expecting. Now that's when the student typically packs his bag and leaves. <laughs> yeah, <I'm done>. okay. <laughs> So we had to try to come up with what is happening there. And uh, through putting together, so I stole one slide now from the turbulence presentation. Uh, through putting together a lot, a lot of, really not machine learning, but pure data analysis, right? We took our experiments, we started doing data analysis of all the distributions, seeing how all the coefficients would affect all the distributions. One of the things we found out that, well, all the experiments are typically down here, right? We are in low flow conditions. We are in the pseudo turbulent regions. Now, our reactor conditions were here, okay? And the data from the BKC starts being up in this region, right? Where the fluid turbulence is dominating. So we started looking at the bubbles in high fluid turbulence conditions. And what we started noticing is that what happens is, as the bubble starts being unstable, its migration gets accelerated immediately, right? So, uh, Akio was showing how the effect of the injection needle, right? When you inject in water, a few years ago we received a paper at a conference in which somebody had measured the lift coefficient of 1,000, right? And my first answer was, are you sure? <laughs> like, I can check the lift coefficient, right? The point is, 
based on the injection system, they were destabilizing the bubble, and the bubble was sticking off with a very high lift in the opposite direction to where we typically go. And that gave us an important idea. It told us what we need to track bubble wobbliness as the important characteristic in a, in a turbulent flow. Now, of course, what is wobble wobbliness, right? We can describe it as, yeah, as my students make fun of this, that's wobble wobbliness, right? How my bubble is wobbling around. How do I quantify? Hard to say. Certainly, we want something that tells us the shape, right? We need to know the shape because, of course, it's much easier to destabilize a bubble that is already deformed. But then we need a force that destabilizes, so something that kicks the bubble, and that's the turbulent kinetic energy. And then, you have a force that resists to being destabilized, which is the dynamic force of the bubble itself. If the bubble is rising very fast, then the kick that it gets from the turbulence is, more, is less important than if the bubble was almost dead. Okay? Now, of course, how you correlate this is going to be very challenging. The beauty is, call Greta and say, Greta, can you run now for me 50 conditions at turbulent for a single bubble, and then I can optimize my model? And you will tell, yes, of course. In three years, you'll have this, right? So what we did is something different. And we said, well, then let's take a set of experimental data and train the model from experiments, right? If we take one set of model and we do the training, then we should be able to test it somewhere else. And I'm not going to go through all the details, but the other part that was important for us is we need models that work in industrial applications. And we often run our model steady state. Now, lift is a very tricky form because it looks at the gradient of velocity and it's proportional to the gradient of velocity. But then you have the rot of the gradient, so it makes it even worse. So try to imagine you're starting your flow simulation. You have the wrong flow velocities. You have very high gradients. You have a high lift coefficient, so it overshoots and <coughs> your code crashes. And typically, you know, if you are the support guy at the commercial company, you get the guy complaining, oh, my code doesn't run, your mother suck. Well, you gave it forces that didn't make any sense. So of course, you're not crushed. So one of the things that we needed to add is try to, to account also for the fact that lift will decrease with high volume fraction. Right? There is a maximum packing factor for bubbles. If I pack them at the maximum packing factor, they can't move around that much anymore. So my lift has to decrease with a high volume fraction. <coughs> the way we do it is simple. We know that from experiments that until 20% interaction bubble to bubble is very small, and that a full packing it's extremely high, and so we really just fit kind of a dumping function between 20 and 50 percent. So with these two characteristics in mind, we now have a model that is very robust. What I say robust is if you go to Westinghouse, Arriva, and you ask them, what do you use for lift coefficient in your model? They say, nothing, because otherwise it crashes. Okay? I tried them all those that were in the code, and they'll crash. So we use no lift at all. Now we give them a model that actually they can use, and that is very robust. On our side, we try to expand the database of validation. If I put the points of literature, typically we have a few points that are scattered. We've been trying to use all the databases complete. Here I show four of them. We are daily expanding this set of databases where we do the validation. And we finally have a model that can get the migrations of the bubbles correctly across a large set of databases. And I will not go through each of them, but if I collapse all the data together, and my colleague, Professor Bongiorno, loves this type of cumulative error, so I end up always putting them together, otherwise he asks for them. What we show is that across a large set of numbers, this is the training data, so it's kind of cheating if I leave it there, so if I take it away, I still have 90% of my data that fits the void fraction prediction with less than 5% error. So we have a model that is industrial and can be used in a lot of applications. Of course, we would love to now evaluate it in real geometries, and we start having a lack of data. So thanks to Professor Podowski that went to visit Professor Prasser, uh, spent enough time to get us at least one set of data in the subflow test facility where, of course, nothing is perfect. So you are at atmospheric pressure, not a reactor pressure. Professor Prasser at least was smart enough to say, if I make the geometry bigger, the ratio of bubble size to channel, it looks kind of the same. Right? So it still makes a little bit of sense. Clearly, the bubble behavior, not exactly, right? Because the densities are different, the interface of forces are different. But at least you have dimension that makes sense. And for that set of data, again, we can use the same set of closures and demonstrate that we can track the typical phenomenon in which the spacer with the swirling veins will create an agglomeration of the void fraction similar to the experiments. 
to then redistribute it as I move away from the space. The problem is I have one set of these data, I want 20, and Professor Prasser put that facility in a box and sent it to Penn State. So now I'm trying to push the guys at Penn State of taking it out of the box and uh, do a lot of tests. Okay? So the more tests we have for these kind of conditions, the better. So that was one example of how we, we leverage everything that we've learned from Lyft, but then we always point out you know, something else in industrial application and how to try to close the gap. The other part, of course, is, is boiling in itself. And here, it's not just nuclear power plants. I can show you at least one paper in which I published something on boiling in solar power plants. The beauty of it is I only publish one paper in solar power plants. I have more citations for that paper than for all my nuclear power paper together. Okay. So definitely, there is a lot of audience here. <laughs> here, we have a direct steam generation. And so I have, we had an eight kilometer line where we're boiling inside the pipes themselves. And we have to predict what is the void fraction across the whole system. And we did that in transient with CFD. So we need models that are efficient, okay? We need something that is still fast. But what we also want to do is to push it all the way to critical heat flux, but without having to introduce any artificial ad hoc models. The industry, if I look in, a, I was extremely surprised when I said the first time at the ITER project, right? This super advanced uh, $100 billion fusion machine where they put 100 megawatts per square meter on, this, on, on the walls, so 10 times what we have. And then you ask them, how do you model heat transfer? And they are like, it is well. Beautiful correlation. Okay? So they use a critical heat flux correlation and a heat transfer correlation. So if it melts, don't be too surprised. Okay? <clears throat> what we're trying to do instead is we now have available data that can actually give us all the dynamics that happens at the wall. Now, Professor Podowski pioneered really trying to have a mechanistic representation of what happens at the wall. We wanted to push it a level further and say, well, we now have all these measurements, right? The, the students can run one, actually five experiments a day. Then it takes us three months to post-process those experiments and get the heat fluxes out of it. So we can actually backward calculate what is the local heat flux under the bubbles. And you see a lot of complexity, right? The high heat flux is the micro layer under each of the bubble that evaporates. The dark blue is the dry spot that each of the bubble leaves away. Bubbles are moving and sliding. And then you have this dry spot out here, which is going to be critical heat flux, local DMB. From that, we wanted to put all this complexity into a model, right? So we had to create models for bubble sliding, for statistical interaction of the bubbles, deactivation of sites due to sliding quantification of microlayer, dry areas, so a lot of things. I could go through all of them. Instead, I put them all into a mind map, just to give an idea of how much pieces are there. So the model has to do all these, and all the models have to talk to each other, and all of them have to be mechanistic. Okay? So we have no more correlations in there. Everything is mechanistic. <coughs> so the idea is, what well, if now I'm representing heat flux correctly, I should be able to do nothing and get critical heat flux as a limiting condition of my energy balance at the wall. That's what we're proposing. Now, before doing that, in uh, 2014, we published a paper in which we said, well, the students were able to run experiments up to here back then, right? So we compared to the experiment, and we found something interesting, that among all the mechanisms that remove heat, the single phase mechanism were the dominant. So evaporation was only about 20% of the heat removal, and the rest was coming from bubble sliding and regeneration of the boundary layer every time a bubble either slid or moved into the bulk. Now, of course, somebody immediately took that idea and developed models that are based only on bubble sliding. Right? Well, it's quite a stretch considering we're at one bar, 20% of heat flux, there's everything else. Right? So you cannot impose heat partition. You have to find out what heat partition is. The problem is, how did we validate it? Five years ago, nobody knew how to measure these quantities. And so we put three PhD students and two professors to figure out how to post-process that. And finally, they can now give me data. And uh, I can have experimental measurements of my heat partitioning versus modeling of the heat partitioning. And I published the, the modeling five years before, so you can trust me that it was blind. <coughs> And we can see that they're very, very similar. Okay. So we see that as I increase the heat flux, of course, my evaporation becomes important. And the same happens with high pressure. As I increase the pressure, the evaporation becomes important. And that goes back and makes sense and tells you, well, 
then in literature they were telling me that 80 percent of evaporation probably made sense up there, right? It doesn't necessarily make sense down here. So how do we push it to DMB prediction? Well, if I now track all this mechanism, what is DMB? Well, DMB is the fact that locally some of these bubbles that are generated start being generated very close to each other. And every time a bubble departs, there is a dry spot that needs to be quenched. Unfortunately, if these bubbles start being generated too fast, too close to each other, you don't have time to quench the local dry spot, and it will start growing and lead you to a critical heat flux condition. This was also experimentally quantified by Jules O'Kim, who, who was able to correlate the amount of dry area with the DMB and showed that it seemed to make sense. So the idea that we propose is not crazy, but what we wanted to show is that it can actually be demonstrated that the model can predict it. So then I gave another challenge to the experiment. As they said, you measure me the heat fluxes, and yeah, you did a pretty good job in measuring the partitioning. Now you're going to measure all the other components of my model one by one. Okay? Because if you do that, and then instead of using my mechanistic closure, I plug in all the measured quantities into my model, then I have to get the right body curves, otherwise the model is wrong. All right? So I do the backward testing of fitting all, the, all those components in. And I won't show you all the fitting, but at least for one bar, we were able to demonstrate that indeed if I plug in all those measured quantities, and this is my experimental curve, up to when I shut down the facility because I'm heat flux regulated, so I would blow, I would jump to a high temperature and damage the facility. In my computation, I can drive it by temperature, and so I can actually predict the critical condition and the degrees of the heat transfer. And I can get very similar predictions at one bar. What's my challenge now? That was one bar. That's the dimension of your bubbles. This is already 10 bar. That's the dimension of your bubbles. Okay? So things change very, very fast. And all the mechanistic models that we have done, I mean, yes, validated at 1 and 2 bars. We now have to validate them at 10 bars. First problem is we did these experiments, but we didn't expect the bubbles to be that small. So our Infrared camera didn't have the resolution, right? So we have like two pixels per bubble, okay? It's pretty hard to see a bubble with two pixels, right? So we had to buy a much more expensive camera, boost the resolution, and now we will try to measure the same quantities in these kind of conditions, right? So the more you model, the more of the challenges. For me, it's great because I produce results, and then I want to see if the experimentalists can match my calculations, okay? So I go the other way around. The other part that the industry is really giving us pressure is well great you do all this great academic work but what happens in my reactor when my surface starts oxiding crudding i change the rod so the idea is we need a model that is capable of predicting how my heat transfer changes and how my critical heat flux changes with the conditions of the rod that's the real target and the model has that potential because all we tell to the model is how many nucleation sites what's the contact angle and everything else come out of the model itself but we need some validation data. And so we started looking at and controlling different surfaces. And this year, we started picking <coughs> zircaloy and inconel, machine it to reproduce roughnesses that are typical of uh, fuel. We were not allowed to show the real roughness of a real rod from a nuclear reactor. The export control in the US would get in trouble. And so we are allowed to just say that it's <coughs> okay. Now you will wake up Uber. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But we try to reproduce it, and we try to reproduce also contact angles that are representative. And you'll see that immediately, when you change between our transparent heaters, with are very specific, very small cavities, very low number of cavities, to a real machined surface, the boiling curve starts moving around, right? You have more sides, you have boiling starts in much earlier, but it's very interesting. You start earlier the boiling, but you reach critically the flux earlier as well. So the models are able to see this difference. And uh, the new challenge is now Inconel and Zircaloy looked very similar, have body curves that look very similar, but have huge differences in the critical heat flux. Right? So this is our next challenge in trying to figure out what is yeah. happening there. Right? The beauty is that for the regulator, otherwise I get in trouble, yeah. this happens at one bar. 
not a reactor condition. So, okay? When you move a reactor condition, the two numbers get very, very close. That's at least what the model says. So, is yeah. watching you. Exactly. Since so, he's there, yeah. I have to be careful. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You should be careful. <laughs> so, we have a model, we have all the feasibility that is necessary. We really need a lot, a lot of experiments to try to figure out how to understand the, the extension to full pressure condition to oxide surfaces. That's where we're going. And I'm done with the time. Yeah. I can close by saying that we're speaking well, electric cars. Electric more. Perfect. Electric cars, we were speaking in the other room. This is my electric car. Okay. okay. And if I put a nuclear reactor in the back, that's an electric car that lasts forever. But you have to change the pilot. Okay. No. So this is Cadillac. Actually, proposed this concept. Right? Yeah. We're thorium fuel concept. Uh, Henry Ford had designed the Ford Nucleon many years ago. He had a nice model. He put at least the reactor a little far from the driver. So it's a very long car. <laughs> and that's the future. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Emilio. Very challenging <laughs> presentation. Okay, does anybody have some? Yeah, please. Can you turn on slide number thirty-six? Oh. Thirty-six. Thirty-six. It's coming. Yeah, give it a second. Yeah, I, I told it to go there. You said this already. It's close. It's coming. There you go. See. Uh, this is MATLAB. Blue line is MATLAB. Correct. For the boiling curve comparison, and you have also got a transition boiling. This is a transition boiling. Correct. So this is a critical thrust point, right? Okay. And this is the transition boiling, and this is the lighter first point. So since we are going into, we controlling the simulation, the temperature. So theoretically, we can capture the lighter thrust. There's a little problem. <coughs> Well, experimentally not, because we control the heat flux and we have to shut down the and facility. this is the okay. critical heat flux that experimentally. That Correct. Point, okay. So experimentally we control the heat flux, so we have to shut down the facility, otherwise we would jump and break and the facility. The boiling and then we burn out. Yeah. Now in the experiments, you, in the simulation, you can control the temperature, so you can see the curve. Now don't trust anything about this region of the curve, because we don't have any of the models that represent the heat transfer correctly. After, so in post DMB, we haven't done any work yet on modeling. In theory, you could push even in post DMB. So, one thing, in the nuclear boiling design, later, later. Uh, on the so, I, I had to, of course, skip a lot of the details because the paper only that describes the model is 35 pages. Okay? So, this paper only has 35 pages of all the components. Now, for the interaction, you could do a lot of sophisticated things. We have a simple model, which is if we look at the measurements of nucleation sites, we saw that more or less they are normal distributed. Not really, there's a little bit, but more or less they are normal distributed. So if we assume them to be normal distributed, then I can use complete spatial randomness theory. And so I calculate the probability of interaction based on the complete spatial randomness theory. And then I know what is the probability that a bubble will be generated under the area of influence of another bubble. And that allows us to detect which bubbles are interacting. Correct, so this is all simulated and compared with the experiment because we can measure it as well. So we have all the interactions in the experiment, we have interactions in the model, we can compare the direct. So this is a profiling in a tube. It's a vertical channel, it's rectangular. Yeah. So the same thing that you see in the model, we have in the experiments where we have flow going upwards and we can measure all those quantities as well. It takes okay. a long time this process. Yeah. Okay, we have from Westinghouse. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, oh. yeah. Uh, Carson, are you also like developing uh, models for um, predicting uh, uh, CPR, the critical power ratio? So, I in the first slide, I showed that we're looking also at the high voltage fracture regimes right now in two different ways. There is much more to learn there. So, I have two students working on just predicting film thicknesses by trying to develop deposition models that are local, which we don't have right now, we only have integral deposition models, and entrainment models that are local, and there is more in the literature of those. And then we are doing experiments in which we actually do the same experiments as here, so heating the water, <coughs> but with films. The first request we had was actually to measure the uh, sub nucleate suppression, so right now we're working simply on the suppression of nucleate boiling, 
So when the film is thin enough, you see that some nuclear bombing goes away because there is very good conduction through the film. In the future, we'll go towards dry out of the film, but that's not in the very short term. Okay, NRC is not asking you anything, but Mike is burning to ask you something. Yeah. <laughs> Slide 31. <laughs> <laughs> no. That yes, yes, okay. That, yeah. A conceptual issue. Yeah. You are telling me that 20% goes to evaporation and 80% goes to a single phase. phase. Okay. What happens to this 80%? In an experiment, if you dissipate the energy, you can say, okay, the 20% is the direct heat transfer at the, at the surface. But if you think about flow in a reactor channel, all the heat goes to evaporation. No. Sooner or later, you cannot continue heating the liquid. Only when you reach saturation condition. This is some cool condition, that's not true. No, this was You didn't cool. mention some cool This is all some cool conditions. This is all some cool nuclear body. Of course, if you're in saturated yeah, conditions, that's that is important. Right. That's the point, right? So the matter of interpretation is very yeah, important sure. because one can draw a conclusion that okay, 80% goes to to feed the liquid and what happens to the heat. Yeah. And that's why that's why you cannot prescribe it, right? Yeah. You have to always yeah. yeah. Okay, we have a cool. time for one more question. You want? Yeah. Yeah, please. So, uh, very nice work, and uh, I really like it. Uh, so you model uh, the flow in a fluid channel, you have a space up, so this axial flow. Uh, similar conditions in the UVDC generator, so you have axial flow here, then you have post flow at the UVDC generator. Do you have, you, so, have you done any work in that? So we are actually, one of the big problems is, uh, we did some work, but we were like an experiment. Okay. So I've been looking around for who has this experiment. And we found out that in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, right, there is some good work that has been done in that direction. Those <coughs> potentially are new data that we could build our facility. That's your facility. Okay, so that's the best data. We are building our facility. So very good. So right now the only data that we have are fully proprietary and we're obtained in Japan with SF6 and uh, uh, so was a, was ethanol and SF6 in order to reproduce the real density ratio. Now in a lab in university, if I start using ethanol in SF6, I kill students and they don't like it. So. We, used have, we used to have refrigerant in heaven, like you know, about 20 years ago, but now we are replacing with one uh, R123 okay. to get the same conditions. So I know definitely the data are lucky, right? Good measurements there are pretty true. So I hope I'll to use. Okay, thank you, Emilio, for this presentation. Now is the lunch time. After the lunch time, we will start with a poster session, 1415, and then in this room. We'll